Hi everyone, I think we'll make a start. Hopefully you can see me and hear me okay. So welcome, first of all, to the April edition of Cybar. Um, and more importantly, um, the first ever virtual Cybar that we have attempted. It is important that you know that this is the first time we've tried this. Um, and that's so that you can be just as prepared as we are for something to ultimately go wrong. Hopefully it won't, but it doesn't hurt to really temper those expectations. Um, so you'll notice um, that all of your microphones and videos have been turned off. Um, we'd like you to keep it this way. And um, this is just to minimize any disruption during tonight's talk. So for any of you that don't know me, hi, I'm Nicola. I'm one of the events organizers for Palace of Science. Um, usually I'm responsible for organizing um, Cybar in person um, every month. That's usually when the world's a little bit less virusy. Um, and recently we've been holding Cybar at the Tyneside Cinema. So hopefully when this is all over, we are looking forward to get back, getting back um, to normality and back to the Tyneside. Generally, we hold all of our events in a location where there is red, uh, ready access to beer. It's not essential that you drink beer during tonight's talk, but we do find um, that it helps understand all scientific and mathematical concepts, but it's not essential. So hopefully wherever you are, you are well catered for, um, for tonight's event. So for anyone that has been to the physical event before, tonight's virtual event is going to run very much the same. So we're going to have a talk tonight from Dr. David Cushing. Um, he's going to talk to us about the mathematics of magic. And it, you may have seen in our uh, waiting room um, that there is a slight interactive element to tonight's talk. So if you want to play along um, and learn a bit of magic yourself, if you have access to a deck of cards, then that will be useful. Please do grab that now. Um, if it's not a full deck, that's fine. Apparently, you only need, I think it's four cards to take part, so four different cards. And obviously, if you have access to beer, go for that as well. That'd be great. So the talk is going to last about 30 minutes, um, and then we're going to have a five-minute break. So that allows you all to get another drink. Um, and also, during that time, I'm going to turn on a chat box in Zoom so if you have any questions that you want to ask Dave about his talk or himself, perhaps, um, then during that break, you can type your questions into the chat box. After the break, um, Dave will come back and he can read the questions from the chat box um, and answer them. So um, tonight's event, if you have any connection issues or if you drink too much beer and you forget about it, it will be recorded. Um, so you can watch it again and again to your heart's content. Um, and I think that is about everything I need to tell you. So I'm going to introduce Dave now, Dr. David Cushing. Um, he did his PhD in pure maths at Newcastle University um, and then a postdoc at Durham in graph theory. But tonight he is going to talk to us all about the mathematics of magic. So I will pass over to him. Um, hopefully he is online listening to me, Dave. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, um, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to be doing some uh, maths behind magic tricks. I'm going to be showing a few tricks and some of them you'll be able to learn and perform yourself. Um, most of what I'm going to do is uh, about shuffling, uh, different ways of shuffling the mathematics behind it. So to start with, if everyone has their decks of cards, if you can take uh, four cards uh, from your deck. It can be any four. I'm using these nice large cards. And just give them a nice random mix-up. And hopefully we're going to do a trick with everyone who is watching. So once you've got your four cards, if you haven't got any cards through, uh, available, then any four scraps of paper would do. If you can get your hand on anything, as long as you can distinguish between them. So I've wrote some numbers on there. So once you've got your four cards, I want you to uh, put them in this order. So face up, face down, face up, face down. So they alternate like this. And once you're done, uh, you can take the card and you can give them a cut. And a cut is just putting 
either one card from top to the bottom, or maybe two or three. Now, I want you to, you can turn the cards over if you're not happy with the cards you can see. And I want you to cut the card so there's a face up card on top. Now, this is going to be your card. So my card's the Ace of Spades. And now I'm going to hide this card. So I'm going to take the Ace of Spades, turn the face down, and then cut the cards. So now my selected card, and everyone else trying to remember yours, is now hidden. Now we're going to chaotically mix up the cards. And the way we do that is a special shuffle. We take, pick up the top two cards, turn them the other way, drop them on top as one, and then give the cards a cut. And then take the top two cards, turn them the other way, give them a cut. And just repeat this for however long you want. You can cut different cards. You can cut one card, do the turn, then you can cut three, whatever you want. So I'll just give you a minute to catch up there. Right, now I'm going to try and perform a mathematical ritual to find every single person's cards. So the way it goes is you take the top card, turn it the other way, and move it to the bottom of the deck. Then you take the next card, don't turn it, put it on the bottom. Take the next card, turn it the other way, and put it on top. Now, hopefully, if you look at your cards, one card should be facing the other way compared to all of the others. And hopefully, that will be your card. Now, it's normally a lot easier in person. You can get visual feedback if this actually worked. But I'm sure you can let me know when chat where chat opens up whether or not that worked. But well, hopefully it did for most, if not all, people. Oh, yes, there's thumbs up things on Zoom. I just saw you thumbs up. So you could... Uh, ah, it worked for two people, at least. <laughs> right. Aha, yes, it seems to have been working. Cool. <coughs> right, now I'm going to actually explain... A little bit of this. Uh, let me just share my screen. Here we go. Do -do -do. And present. Oh, that's annoying. Zoom's in the corner over the buttons. There we go. Okay, so that shuffle, what we had there, I'm just going to get a separate deck of cards. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen and myself is known as the Hummer Shuffle. So I'll just get a batch of the little cards here. And what a Hummer Shuffle is, is you take a deck of cards of an even number, so two, four, six, eight, eight will do. We were using four. And what it is, is you take the top two cards, turn them over and cut. This is what a Hummer Shuffle is. And you can do it as many times as you want. And you should get a random mix of face up and face down cards. Now, there's a. I'm going to go through a lot of different shuffles tonight, and lots of mathematicians study the properties of different shuffles. And this shuffle has a theorem to it. So, the number of face up cards at even positions. So, uh, so the even positions are two four, six, and eight, and there's two face-up, is equal to the number of face-up cards at odd positions. So one, three, uh, five, and seven. So there was two. Now, why does that allow me to do the trick that I just did? So, the re... Oh, did I miss a slide? Oh, no, there. So... What this means is that if the even position card started facing the other way, so I'll do that with this. I'll just use six cards. If I start with them facing the other way, whenever I do a Hummer shuffle, 
it forces the same number of cards to be facing one way. And it's uh, much easier to see it this way, I think, instead of starting with them all face down. Because you can see if I cut the cards, they stay alternating. So they're not the same numbers the correct way. They can't flip. And if I take the top two cards, you'll see uh, it goes face up, face down. If I turn them over, it stays face up, face down. So if I cut, here I've got face down and face up. If I turn them over, so I'm preserving the face up, face down strategy. So now I'll go back to how many cards I had in the original trick. And I'll just discuss the algorithm at the end. We've discussed that no matter how many Hummer shuffles you do, you're going to alternate face up and face down. Now what the algorithm did, essentially, it took a card and did that, then it did that, then it did that. All the algorithm does is turn them to all face one way. So then the question is, well, how come your chosen card was facing the other way? So when we chose our card, we turned it the other way and did a cut. And this breaks everything. So this card here should be facing the other way. So therefore, when we do all the rest of the trick, it ends up facing the opposite. And that's how the trick works. Now, there's lots of other mathematics involved in this uh, shuffle. So you can compute, uh, given the starting uh, deck, how many different positions can you get? So um, is it possible to take a deck of cards, say, throw them around to the face up and face down? Could I do Hummer shuffles or get it back to new deck order? And the answer is no. And people study things like this with shuffles. How many different positions can you get to? And it turns out it's nowhere near the total amount in the deck. And there's actually been papers wrote on so, uh, a lot more complicated shuffles than this that I will get to. But I thought this is a nice basic one. And hopefully since this is recorded, this is a trick you can do to people. If you take a deck of cards, give four to everyone in the room. Uh, you don't have to do anything. Just follow the instructions and it will hopefully work. So... I'll go on to the next uh, session I want to go to. How many uh, times does it take to shuffle a deck? Now, there's uh, a lot of different ways to shuffle a deck. So one of the, one of the most uh, basic ones is riffle shuffling, like this. There are overhand shuffle, which I know a lot of people do. In casinos, you might see people do that's or poker tables, the wash, where you mix them all onto a table. Uh, there's uh, this sort of uh, shuffle as well. That's done uh, some places in the world instead of an overhand shuffle. And the, it's a proper mathematical question to ask, how many times should I shuffle a deck? So if you're playing a game of cards and you get a deck just out the box, doing that probably isn't enough. Well, how many times should I do it? And there's been, so I'll start with the riffle shuffle. Um, this is a paper by uh, Percy Diaconis, who I'll probably reference a lot during here, and Dave Beer, who uh, simulated a riffle shuffle. So they added lots of random variables to what a riffle shuffle is. So you, when you do this, you get roughly half the deck, but not all. And as the cards fall left and right, they had to put probabilities on of how many go from left and right. But they tested this in practice as well by getting lots and lots of people to shuffle the deck. And it turns out that seven shuffles suffice. If you shuffle a deck seven times like this, it is pretty much random. Now, a lot of bridge players hate these two mathematicians. So after the uh, this paper came out, this actually got um, in lots of bridge clubs in America for tournaments, decided seven shuffles should be done, where people were just using three three or four normally. And bridge players uh, complained because the quality of their hands was much, much worse. 
So there was uh, lots of groups of cards that were no long that were no longer being preserved from the lack of shuffling. So three and four shuffles is actually really bad. But um, when you get a six, it's pretty much there. And then all of a sudden, that's seven. It's uh, very well shuffled. Now, the math there is a bit too complicated to try and quickly explain why seven's enough. But I, oh, and I'm just going to mention how bad the overhand shuffle is. Uh, you need about 2,000 of that because it barely touches the deck and leaves so many clumps together. It's an absolutely terrible shuffle. But I'm going to quickly talk about a very crap shuffle. So if I... My shuffle is going to be, you take the top card, put it somewhere in the deck. That's my shuffle. So how many of these do you think I should have to do to shuffle the deck? And this was another... This shuffle was invented and studied by Percy Diaconus again. And I'm going to actually uh, calculate now the number expected number of times. And this one's quite good. You can see it's truly random. So I'm going to start with the ace of spades on the bottom of the deck. And I'm just going to keep doing these shuffles. And it should be truly random. So humans won't actually do this properly. I'm just putting them in. And all of a sudden, one time... I will put this card below the Ace of Spades, the top card. It might not be the first top card I have, but eventually it'll go. Now, this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the expected number of times for a card to go below the Ace of Spades. It'll become more clear after two or three cards. So how many times do I have to wait for this to happen? Well, if I pick up the top card, there's 52 different places it can go. So um, it will take, uh, so there's 52 different places, but only one of them is what I want. So it will be about 52 times. Now, when I take the next card, how long will it take to go below the Ace of Spades? Well, there's now two positions it can go. It can go there, just below the Ace of Spades, or fully on the bottom. Out of the 52, so 52 over 2 is 26, so it'll take about 26 times. And here's where the important observation comes. Once it goes below the Ace of Spades, it's equally likely to be below that card as it is above it. And there, these two cards' positions with respect to each other is truly random. So then I do it with another card. They miss, they miss, they miss, and then all of a sudden it'll go under. And then when it does... The order of these three cards is completely, truly random. Now, the expected number of times to that third card was 52 over 3. So we add that on. And then we add 52 over 4. And we keep going until the top card's the Ace of Spades. And then we have one more move. The Ace of Spades goes anywhere. And the, we can say 100% certain the deck is completely random. So we know the overhand shuffle took over 2,000. How long did this one take? Whereas this little sum here, I pulled out the 52, and it's about 235, which I think is quite remarkable because it really is a terrible shuffle. And for any mathematicians, if you've got a deck of end cards, you can see that it's roughly this number of shuffles here because... That bit in the brackets is a harmonic number. So for anyone interested, you can get a nice little asymptotic formula there. Okay. So I talked about uh, the riffle shuffling and the paper uh, that sort of estimated with all these probabilities in. But I want to talk about a different type of shuffle, which can be used to do card tricks. So I've got a deck of cards here, which hopefully you can see is nice and mixed up. I'll try and go a bit slow. There should be some clumps of red, clumps of black, singletons. Now I'm going to give this a few shuffles. Hopefully up. 
facing the camera. And now these are a type of a uh, riffle shuffle. So you can see your taste and mark with the riffle shuffle. I'm pushing the cards into the alternate. I even do that at the end. And I'm going to give this a few of these. So I was talking about before that seven is enough to fully shuffle a deck. That was from new deck order you generally start with. Now I've started mixed up. There's the second one. And I will finally do one more. Now, before I push these in, I'll show you the what they said and why I keep having to restart every so often. What is it exactly which I'm doing here? Oh, missed that one again. There we go. So I'll try and hold these cards here without dropping them. I said this is a perfect shuffle because unlike the randomness, they are alternating one, 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 one. And to prove that a bit better, I have just shuffled it from the random order back into new deck order. You'll see there's all the spades, diamonds, clubs, and hearts. Now, I think it's pretty obvious this could be a very powerful tool for magic tricks, and it is. Um, there's been books wrote on how we could do tricks using this. I'm not going to go through any in particular because it would it takes a very long time to actually learn how to do that shuffle. So even if I explain the trick, it's not an immediate thing to take home. But you can Google and find these things if you are interested in trying to learn it. Now I've got those deck that deck back in new deck order there. I'd like to talk a bit about the mathematics of that. How many times did I, do I have to do that to start from, say, this order? If I keep doing that, how many times did I get back to where I was? And it turns out eight times, uh, which is quite small, I think, for 52 cards. And what about other decks? Um, so here, so this is starting with a... Obviously, if you've got a deck with one card, you only have to do it once. And then it's a, a two, two, four. And if you look, there should be next to each. So it should go 21, 21, eight, eight. This eight here is 52. So 52 cards takes eight times. But if we had a 52, 53 or 54 card deck. It suddenly takes 52 times. So if I had a deck of cards with jokers in them, it would take me 52 times to shuffle them uh, back to perfect order. So the way I set this deck up was I just took it in this order, did it five times, and it got back to there. Now I'd like to talk a little bit quickly about where this magic number eight comes, and there's some number theory in it. So if I take the number two and raise it to the power of eight and subtract one, I get this number 255. So if anyone doesn't know, 2 to the power of 8 is just 2 multiplied by 2 by 2 by 2. So you just keep doubling 8 times and you get 256. You subtract the 1. And now I take 52, the number of cards in my deck. Subtract 1 is 51. I divide 1 by the other. And if it, if it gives a proper whole number, no remainder, it means that that number of shuffles will get me back to where I was. Now, I won't explain why in full, but um, a little hint of what's going on is if I have a card in position 10 and I do one of these shuffles, uh, for every card above it, that number doubles. So there was, say, nine cards above it and I did one of these shuffles. You can imagine this card's been interlaced above and it will go down... So it's position doubles. This is where the doubling number two is in. And these numbers are actually uh, very hard to compute. But they're, they're easy to compute in a computer, I mean. But when you get to very, very big numbers, there's no just magic formula to split it out. You literally have to do these sort of calculations. Okay. And uh, I'm sure I can put a link somewhere to everything I reference. 
So here's uh, people who study these perfect shuffles. Now there are uh, other shuffles. So some people do a, uh, there's something called the horseshoe shuffle where people take the deck and instead of doing a perfect shuffle straight away, you flip it face up and shuffle them in and you keep repeating that. And people have calculated how many times did you do that to bring it back to new deck order. One of the other mathematical things, I'm just giving a brief tour here, is um, uh, giving a shuffle, uh, can I get to every single position? Now, I mentioned with the Hummer shuffle I couldn't, and clearly with the Perfect shuffle I can't, because uh, eight of them gets me back to where I was. So instead of the trillions of positions in the deck, I can only see eight. Well, with the Hummer shuffle, I added this extra cut. I could cut the deck. So it turns out if I do a perfect shuffle and cutting, you can get any position in the deck. And this is another study thing. And people will look at which combination of shuffles gives you the whole deck and which partial things as well. Now, there's lots and lots of other shuffles. And I'm going to quickly do... I'll try and move the camera a bit so you can actually see the cards down here. I'm going to try and do a, another quick trick here. So I normally get a card selected, but I'm basically just going to have to uh, select a card myself, I guess. So, uh, yeah, there's no really fair way to do this. I'm just going to take the top card. And uh, actually, I'll just reveal it. So this is the three. Now... Uh, yeah, I've got uh, a bit mixed up. So I normally ask for a spectator now to name uh, a magician who's going to help me find the other threes in this deck. Now, because I can't ask anyone, I'll use... So I will use one of these. So when I show this trick to Ron Graham, uh, the ma mathematician he named as Percy Diaconus. Uh, magician, sorry. Um, and this trick is mathematics based. I'm not going to go into it fully, but I just want to show you a certain um, trick with shuffling that you can do. So Percy Diaconus is going to help me find this card. Now, something Percy loves is spelling tricks. So I'm going to spell his name to help him find it. So I'm going to spell, where can you see there? So P... Let me put that there. So P-E-R-S-I for Percy, and then D-I-A-C-O-N-I-S. Now, if you spell Percy Diaconus's name, let's just say his surname Diaconus, three times he'll be summoned to perform a magic trick. So I'm going to try it. D-I-A-C-O-N-I. S. Now I'm going to drop the others on top. And I'm going to do it a second time. D I A C O N I S. And finally, D I A C O N I S. Drop the others on top. And hopefully, the other next top three cards are the other threes. Now, what happened there is I won't go through it all, but I did a special shuffle there. And if you did a special shuffle three times, uh, order of the, the certain order of the deck is preserved. And so it's related back to the other tricks I was showing. Uh, it might be for an exercise for you to try and uh, work that out backwards and how that was done. All right, time I doing for time? Because right, this is the last... Uh, section i'm just going to make a bit of room because i'm going to bring back the giant cards so i'm going to talk about a one last shuffle this is called the gilbert shuffle now i said before that the number of a uh, shuffle you need to fully shuffle a deck riffle shuffles was seven and i said if you only did say two or three or so or even up to four then that's very rubbish but how rubbish. Now, if you only do one of them, you can really abuse this and do some magic tricks. So what a Gilbert Shuffle is, first of all, 
It's got this big pack of cards. Uh, it's got a process like before. You deal some down to a pile on the table. I'll do roughly half. There we go. And I'm actually going to share this screen just so you can hopefully see the cards bigger for this. So hopefully you can see my screen larger now. Right, now I'm going to shuffle these together. Uh, <coughs> they're actually quite hard to riffle shuffle, so I'm going to do something that's very it's isomorphic to riffle shuffle. So it's called a, uh, I forgot what it's called, a dove tail shuffle? I forgot now. No, that's not right. Anyway, Rosetta shuffle. Yes, so you spin them like this and then you just mash them together and it's isomorphic and it looks very, very messy. They're the same as a riffle shuffle. I was trying not to use proper mathematical words. I realise I've said isomorphic about 10 times. Okay, so once we've done that, we have a hopefully shuffle deck, but hopefully for the magician, not really that shuffle at all. <coughs> now, I'm going to frame this in the probability question. Roughly, say roughly, what's the probability of these top two cards that have been randomly shuffled? We have one red and one black. It's roughly a half, not actually quite. But let's see if we're lucky, we are. We have one black and one red. Now, I'd normally wait until the very end to reveal all these, but there's just not enough room. So what's the probability the next two, in addition, is one red and one black? Well, we've done it, and that's, again, roughly a half. So we're already looking at a one in four chance. Uh, the next two... One red and one black, we're at one eight. Here, if we get one red and one black, we'll be at one in 16 chance. And we can keep going, but to speed it up, I'll take the next four cards. What's the probability we have a spade, a heart, a club, and a diamond? Well, we thankfully do have a spade, a heart, a club, and a diamond. Remember, this was after a shuffle. I'll take four again. And we have spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. Another four. We have spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. I'll take another four. We have spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. I think I've got 28 cards left. So I'll take another two. And they should hopefully be one red, one black. So all these probabilities is making it into the billions now. And to speed it up, I'm going to take the top 13. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now these cards are in a totally random order. It's an ace, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5... A six, seven, an eight, a nine, ten jack, queen, and a king. And I'll just quickly go through there, and you see that there's hopefully no duplicates, and there's one of each from ace through to king. Right, so it turns out that you can predict quite a lot of things after only one shovel. And I'm going to go back to share my screen. Uh, this one. Here we go. So, oh, it's going backwards. A trick. So, now we've done the trick, we're going to have the mathematical theorem. And I forgot to mention this before, but when I was doing my uh, postdoc at Durham, I actually taught maths and magic for final year undergrads. So a lot of what I'm doing tonight was including students' uh, final year projects. So one of my students took this theorem and um, 
explored it really far. So we, unfortunately, you can't actually do tricks with it because you need hyperdimensional decks of cards to do it. But you can distill this into a purely mathematical world. Um, he is not wrote in the math, so I'm just going to take... Um, and everyone at home who's got a deck of cards can do this. These are very bad cards. Let's take these. Uh, take out four black and... That's odd. Four black and four red. Do, 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 do. And I want you to alternate them, red and black. Now, what this theorem says is you perform a Gilba shuffle. So what this was, was you deal some cards face down. What, say, let's just do four. You could do three or five. But it's nice to have roughly the same. Because then we're going to riffle shuffle them together. Remember, if that's hard, you can spin the cards like this and then mush them together to create a random order. It then says that the top two will be one red, one black. Next two will be one red, one black. Next two will be one red, one black. And then next two. No, what it doesn't say is the order does not go of red, black, red, black, red, black, red, black. It's just every two will be one of each. Now, the best way I have of explaining this is I'm going to put the cards back in this order. Uh, that's not that order. There we go. Now, I'm going to do the trick face up. So I'm going to deal some cards. Uh, four. And you'll notice that the top card of each pile is a different colour. If I'd have done one less, it's a different colour. Now, what is a riffle shuffle? A riffle shuffle is the cards mix, mixing like this, but it's essentially a decision, starting from the top of the deck, which card of these two piles is next to be the top card. So, for example, let's say I pick this one, which is a red one. Notice what we forced. The next card must be a black. So it we'll, doesn't matter which one we pick. And then as they were mixed in, which is the next one, we'll pick a black again. And then the next one has to be a red. So you'll see we get these pairs happening of two colours. And this happens all the way down. Even if you'd have picked two from one side, you'd have been forced uh, to get a pair like this. Now, what I did with the big pack of cards is a bit more complicated, which I'm not going to explain, and it needs the actual mathematical theorem, which is this. Uh, I'll just briefly add some words here. So uh, what a Gilbert permutation is, so a permutation is just a... You can think of them a couple of different ways. So if you have, say, the numbers 1 to 4, then a permutation is a reordering of 1 to 4. So it might be 2, 3, 4, 1. Or another way of a permutation, you can think of it as it's a way to send the integers one to four to themselves, such that each one goes to a uh, distinct number. So I don't want to get into this too much because this is where it gets quite complicated, but I did want to show you the actual mathematics that um, actually appears in this appeared in the paper, which is quite cool. So a Gilbert permutation is it's a way to just think of permutations as a shuffle deck the numbers one to n mixed up and what it is is you take a card of deck of n cards from one to n you perform a gilbert shuffle like that and that is a gilbert permutation i.e it's a permutation you can get from one of those shuffles so there's some ones you can't get for example if i just mix up the cards all backwards there's no way I could have got that from a... Oh, no, I could have got that one. Uh, if I, say, mix up half of them backwards and then uh, put them in the middle like that and then, say, reverse the top two, something more complicated, you can't get it from a Gilbert shuffle. Or if I just did two riffle shuffles, I probably couldn't have got it. And it turns out there's lots of these different equivalent ways. And the one I'm going to uh, look at here is the second one. 
So it's equivalent that you did a Gilbert shuffle, i.e. a Gilbert shuffle will put you in this decision that for every J, the top J cards are distinct modulo J. Now, what does that mean? That means if I pick any integer J, so let's say two, if I divide my numbers, what the top two cards uh, by two, they will have distinct remainders. So let's unfold that a little bit further. Um, it means that one of them will be odd and one will be even. And the way this works for the little red black trick, and you can use that trick that I just got everyone to do with the eight card red and black, by the way, as a trick. Um, what it says is that let's colour this deck one to N, red and black alternating, red if you're odd, black if you're even. And what this theorem has now said is the little baby version from the previous side that you'll have one black, one black, one black. It actually only says it for the top two cards, but the next bullet point says it happens for the first two, the second two, and so on. And I use the full version of this theorem with three different intersecting sequences in order to create that. That wasn't my trick, but in order to do that trick. And I've probably gone on too long. So thankfully that is the end. So thanks a lot. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, I followed along and I can confidently say I'm ready for Vegas. I've drank too many beers to understand why, but I am definitely ready. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed that. So what's going to happen now, we're going to take a five minute break. So we will be back at 25 past eight. Um, I'm now going to turn the chat box on. Hopefully you will all see that um, on the right hand side. If you have any questions for Dave, then please do type your questions into the chat box um, and we'll be back at 25 past eight where he can answer all those questions for you. So thank you. Okay, hi everyone, welcome back. Thank you for um, typing in your questions. Um, we're going to go back to Dave now, if he's around. Um, hopefully he's seen these questions and he can answer some of them for you. So, um, Yep, I'm back. Yeah, there. <laughs> okay. Hold on, I've lost. So, there's a lot of questions that I can actually answer. Let me, I'll try to do them in order-ish from top. Oh, there you uh, are. Hold on one second. There you go. Yeah, so... I think just to clarify one thing, so seven riffle shuffles is what you need to do at random, but don't do seven perfect shuffles because then you will be uh, basically right back uh, just one more needing what to do. So there's a bit of a distinction between a riffle shuffle and the perfect shuffle. If you just do it randomly, then that's good. You'll shuffle your deck and it's sort of a different, but interesting that they are related. If you did happen to do these perfect eight times, you would get back to where you were which is very unlikely you'll do that. Uh, someone's asked for a cool, quick trick, so I think I'll end with a trick. They leave us wondering, so I will end with a trick and not explain it. Uh, what card trick that you've seen someone else perform has left you the most baffled? Uh, I'll have a think while I go on. Uh, how many times did you need to shuffle the deck to resemble the original deck order? So... As I mentioned, doing eight of these shuffles takes you from, if you started in the original deck order, doing eight will get back to where you were. If you didn't start in the original deck order, doing eight of them doesn't get you back to where you are, uh, get you back to original deck. Uh, you've got very little chance because you're only going to go through eight different choices. You will get back to where you were. But like I said before, if you introduce a cut and a shuffle, you can get back, and I think it's a, it's something like at most 40, it would take far too long to do, but at most 40 shuffles. So there's some group theory here. So it turns out that the symmetric group, for any mathematician, the symmetric group from 52 elements can be generated with this move and a perfect shuffle. And I got one of my students to do this, and I'm not a group theorist, but they looked it all up. 
it's talking about putting it into normal form, I think, and then you can count the most number of times the shuffle appears, and it's something like 40 or 41. Yeah, the what I didn't mention this, but the wash shuffle, uh, how random is that? And uh, that is very random, and this has been studied as well. If you do the wash shuffle for about a minute, it will be pretty much completely random. It passes most tests that uh, people have to check for randomness. Um, uh, some of the, I'll just say what some, some of these tests are, is uh, these tests are used not just in cards, but in uh, checking financial data, etc. cetera. Um, humans are very bad at coming up with random things. So there's also mathematical ways to check if a set of numbers is truly random. Now, one of them is, is if I go through a deck of cards, a human, so look at these, these I had shuffled, and we've got this big batch of reds there. Now, a human would never, ever do that. I'm not sure of the exact number, but in a truly random uh, deck, you will get big streaks of cards like this together. Um, so that's one of the ways we check to see how many uh, uh, shuffle you need to do. You do tests of randomness like this to see, is it now truly random? So that was about one minute for the wash shuffle. Uh, they also asked, why do casinos do other types? And I don't know. Maybe just to make sure. Maybe, maybe a uh, wash shuffle. There might be some reason. Maybe it's possible to glimpse a card so you add different ones in. Uh, question if you have rubbish at riffle shuffles, what's the most efficient way? Well, I'm going to take this deck here because I said with this would take a bit of a time, but this shuffle is a good way to do a riffle shuffle. You ooh, that way, you just twist the cards like this and then mash them into each other. And that is a riffle shuffle. So it does take a bit more time, but it wouldn't take too long. And another way you can do is, it's hard not to do it perfect-ish if you can do it perfect, but you can just push the cards in together like this. And... Unfortunately, once you learn how to do it perfectly, they will alternate perfectly. But if you don't learn and just mash them in, that's a good alternate to a riffle shuffle. But these have gone in perfect one at a time. So I can't do that as a fair shuffle now, because once you learn your hand, just do it every time. Apart from when I needed to do it, I failed a few times. Uh, uh, were decks designed to have 52 cards because of the maths? Now, it's not the math of shuffling, but there is some maths involved into why, but more numerology. So lots of things in the cards have meanings. So there's two colours, red and black, which signifies day and night. The uh, four different suits represent the four seasons. Uh, there's 13 uh, cards in the deck which represents 13 uh, lunar months of the year. And if you add up all the values on the cards, so ace is 1, jack's 11, queen's 12, and king's 13, you get 364 cards, which is almost the number of days in the year, which is why you add the two jokers, two different jokers, so you can get 365 or 366, number of days in a leap year. So there's a, there is sort of maths and numerology, in the, how the decks of cards were designed, but not this sort of maths, which was developed much later. Uh, does the Riffle Shuffle have to be done perfectly a time to get back to the original order? Yes, it uh, has to be done perfectly. If you go wrong, it's messed up. And you can sometimes, uh, if I know the Riffle Shuffle's gone wrong, I will just go with it. So I'll do it wrong with the uh, yeah but the first two so you'll see the hang on uh, if you make a mistake you can do a little correction okay so we haven't quite got enough if anyone has any more questions feel free to add some but if not I can try and uh, I'll move some things around. Dave? Yes. 
you, did you think of an answer to the one um, about the card trick you've been most baffled by? Oh, most baffled. There's some tricks that... Trying to think of one. There's some tricks that I know because a pedant had a fool us that I would literally watch a hundred times until I understand it. Um, there's a Spanish magician uh, who um, called uh, Woody Aragon, who I got to see live, and he completely fooled me with uh, one of his tricks. He's in, coincidentally uh, one of the masters of tricks using the Gilbert Shuffle, but. Uh, I think I know there is some uh, easy to watch tricks. Uh, if you go on to Pen and Teller Foolus, I think uh, there, there's to this guy called uh, Shin Lim, and I literally watched uh, his uh, one of his hundreds of times until I knew could see exactly what was going on. Well, maybe not a hundred. That literally probably was a, of an exaggeration, but a lot of times. And there's a lot of great tricks there um i'm trying to think of one in particular but there is a lot of well if it's not a card trick it generally fools me but it's the card tricks fooling me that i find very interesting right so i doesn't seem to be any more questions i will Sam's asked one this help with blackjack <laughs> Uh, well unfortunately they don't really let you deal the cards in blackjack if you're playing but if you're playing with friends, this could help. <laughs> right. So I talk about lots of shuffles. So the... Hold on, I've got all sorts of cards and everything in the... We're here, mice. I want a bit of room. Okay. So one shuffle that I didn't talk about is called the drunken shuffle. So what you do is you take your cards and you shuffle them Face up, in the face down. Now, I mentioned a couple of uh, shuffles that were face up and the face down, but they were very controlled and perfect. But this is just a bit more chaotic because we have some face up, some fit. So the, even the top two cards there are not the same. But if you just shake the deck slightly, it goes back all the way into correct order. So you'll see here. Got all the blue backs here and all random, uh, all back to normal after the uh, oh, slightly crazy uh, drunk shuffle. Yeah. And uh, fire and one last thing. So, further on the drunk shuffle, there's also one last slight thing you can do. If you take the cards, I'm trying to get the best angle to do this. What you can do is you can just rub the cards. If you just rub, the blue is now red. And now hopefully every single card is red. Okay, so unless there's any more questions, I think that is a good time to end. And you can try and work that one out. At least the first bit. That's great. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thanks so much, Dave. That was that has blown my mind. I thought it was my computer, but okay, no, that was magic. That was magic, everyone. Um, so thanks for that, Dave. Thank you for everyone um, who joined us this evening. Uh, a couple of things. This talk was recorded, um, so we're going to be putting it up on social media and our web page if you want to watch it again it will be available um, to everyone as i said at the start this is the first time we have done a virtual sidebar if you have any feedback for us if it was good um please let us know if it was bad let us know but be gentle about it um this is our first one so hopefully we will be making some improvements um the other thing i wanted to mention normally with our sidebar events um, because they aren't usually recorded, we have a volunteer that offers to write a blog post um, for the event. We've actually had someone that has offered to blog for us tonight, um, and we accept volunteers. If you want to volunteer with us, please check our website. We are happy to welcome anyone. Um, Sarah this evening is our volunteer. Because the actual talk itself has been recorded, she's going to do something slightly different. 
She's going to uh, mention the talk, obviously, but she's also going to focus on some other areas that weren't mentioned. So if you want to find out more information um, about maths and magic, um, then you'll be able to find that in the blog post that will go up on our website in a couple of weeks' time. So please check there. Um, the last thing to mention, hopefully, well, hopefully this whole pandemic thing will be over tomorrow when everything will go back to normal, but probably not. At the moment, we have another sidebar scheduled for next month. It was um, scheduled for the Tyneside Cinema. It's very doubtful that um, that is where it's going to happen. It is potentially going to be online. But I just wanted to share um, with you what that is, just to give you an idea. Um, so what we had scheduled was Dr. Vicky Holden from Newcastle University um, talking about how green spaces benefit our mental health, uh, which is quite interesting. Hopefully she can speak for us next month because considering we're all locked inside our houses, it'd be interesting to know her insight about what this um, versus the green spaces we might not be able to visit um, is having on our mental health. Um, so obviously check our webpage and all our social media pages for updates about this. We may also be doing um, potentially a side quiz. That's one of our other events. We've noticed there's a lot of pub quiz events happening virtually at the moment. If you want one and you want to take part, then please do let us know. We're gonna find out um, how best to do that. Um, I'm more than happy um, to get involved with that. So if you want to see um, a side quiz, then please do let us know. So visit our website, visit our social media. Um, and yeah, we will hopefully have some more events for you soon. But thank you all for joining us. Thanks again to Dave. That was excellent. Um, and everyone, until we see you next time, please keep safe and keep washing your hands. So thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.